Well, I, let, let us go ahead and get started. I did want to welcome everyone, and I do see some familiar faces. Actually, I guess they're all familiar to me now, so that's good. I um, want to thank you for joining us for our summer buffet training. Um, this is um, our 20th year of online learning and innovation, and it's also our first fully virtual event. So it's a, a nice twist to how things are progressing and uh, whether some of it is uh, not necessarily by design, but by circumstance, but we're all getting through that. Today, we have Jesse Vanderlaan, who is the Assistant Professor of Art and Interim Assistant Dean of Humanities Division at Walter State Community College. She received her BFA in printmaking and drawing from Washington University in St. Louis, 2002, and her MFA in studio art at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, 2009. In her time at Walter State, she has been awarded a mobile learning fellowship in which she has integrated digital sketching within an analog printmaking course. Sounds like a pretty good twist in itself. Um, she um, and has developed two art drawing courses for Teen Campus. In the fall, she'll be chairing a panel, Reimagining the Classroom, New Strategies for Building Success and Community at the SC, SECAC conference in Lexington, Kentucky. In addition to her work as director, as an educator, she's uh, also a practicing artist and exhibits her work regionally and nationally. And with that, I give you Jesse Vanderlong. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just start sharing my screen and jump right in. All right, um, put that down. All right, so can everyone see my presentation there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so again, thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Um, and also I wanna thank uh, Pari for both inviting me to present this information to you all today and also for all her help in developing of these two courses, Drawing One and Drawing Two. Um, and so I just wanted to start and just talk a little bit about developing a practice based course. So my um, talk today is going to focus on the drawing courses that I developed, but I hope that some of the strategies I'm presenting today um, could be kind of converted to any class that when we do it in person is a little bit more hands on. So. So when i think about teaching a drawing course this is what teaching a drawing course looks like to me typically this is how i learned to draw when i was going through school and this is how most of my drawing classes have looked like um you know in person you know physically doing something in the space at the same time um, again practice based very hands-on um, Oh, and I also, before I get too far into it, I wanted to say, especially since we're a small group, at any point, if you have a question, feel free just to unmute and shout it out to me. Um, and also, Pari will be monitoring the chat. So if you have a question there, you can put that in and she can prompt me as well. So please feel free to jump in if there's anything you want me to talk about more. Um, so yeah, so I had heard of people teaching drawing online and I just really wasn't sure how that was going to work. Um, but I, there was kind of a need for it that I had gotten the suggestion from Candace um, on our end at Walter State that this was something that the Tennessee eCampus was looking for. And I kind of thought like, well, if there's a chance that any of my students are gonna be teaching, taking an online drawing course, I want to be the one in charge of it. So um, I submitted a proposal for, for drawing one in the fall of 2019 and kind of started working on the development on a, of it in the spring of 2020. Um, and I was really, really thankful because um, everyone became online teachers, as we all know. And so it was really, you know, a benefit during the pandemic that I had already learned how to edit videos and already started thinking a little bit about how I could take what I normally do in person and put it um, through an online format. So the first thing that I really kind of thought about was I just tried to think really big picture of, you know, what do I want students to get out of this class? What do I want to get out of this class? 
um, what is valuable about a studio class and how can I mimic or channel or recreate um, those elements? But also, what are the things that don't go as well in an in-person class? So what can I offer online that I can't do in person? Um, so the first question, what do I want students to get out of this class? Um, I wanted to meet the same course objectives as an in-person studio class. I think that there's probably a little bit of a misconception that um, drawing class is just like a fun hangout and doodle class. Um, and there, I'll definitely address some of that a little bit later as well. Um, that that's definitely still been an issue, but there are real specific course objectives. Um, it is a both practice based class and it is something that you can teach. Um, a lot of teaching drawing is um, about dispelling, dispelling some myths that like you either born being able to have drawings spill out of your pencil or you can't and that's just not the case that it is something that with practice you can learn. Um, I wanted to engage in an in-depth practice of drawing and careful observation. So drawing especially is a really important foundational course for any art student, even if they end up making avant-garde sound art, drawing is really about careful observation. That it's about looking at something and recording something and doing it in this kind of slow and meticulous way. Um, and I think that's a really useful skill for any artist, really for anyone. I think it's, um, akin in many ways almost to like exercise or meditation. It just hones your mind in a different way. So I wanted to make sure that that was still part of the course. Um, and again, to recognize that drawing is that practice based skill. And then I really want to make sure that these students even working in an asynchronous way, we're still developing a relationship with their peers um, because those relationships are really what fuels an artistic career. And so I also had to think about what it, did I want to get out of this class? I wanted to get to know my students. I wanted to make sure that I developed a relationship with them and that I saw their work progress. Um, I especially, one of my focuses, especially in drawing, is to kind of try to look as holistically as possible about over the development of the entire semester. So it was important that I kind of tried to track how students were learning and how they were progressing, um, that I wasn't just kind of looking at each assignment in a vacuum. Um, I wanted to be able to grade with a sense of objectivity, um, that I you know, was really making sure that I was looking at things attached to those course objectives, um, and I wanted it to not be something that was going to you know, be a slog. I wanted to not feel like, oh great, now I have to go grade all these drawings. And also because of the format of the Tennessee eCampus courses, I wanted to feel confident that after I developed the course that I could hand it off to another instructor and that they would be able to teach the course with that same ease um, and enthusiasm and get to some of those same goals that I did, um, especially I adjuncted for six years before my full time position, so I'm very sympathetic to that adjuncts are, you know, really often doing a lot, a lot, a lot of work and I wanted them to be able to walk into this class and feel like it was ready to go for them and they were going to be able to both have a sense of ownership for it, but also kind of know exactly what they needed to do. And so what I'm going to go into with some more depth in this class were these things about what could I mimic um, and what could I offer that I couldn't in a studio class. So the first thing to think about were the instructional methods. So the pros and cons. So in the studio, um, typically a course is going to be I'm going to give some a live demonstration of whatever technique we're working on. The students are going to kind of huddle around me and look over my shoulder as I do that. Uh, I will usually either post, you know, in eLearn or give a quick lecture at the beginning of a module, some examples of some artist and student examples. The thing that I do really like about being in the studio is I can kind of walk around and give them real time feedback. I can see when they're, you know, kind of struggling in one area and give them some tips. Um, and we have group critique, so there is conversation among the students in real time. 
So the kind of answers to that were, what was I going to need to do online? Well, I was going to need to record that demonstration. I could still use my same artist and student examples. The students were going to get a little bit of delayed feedback and we were going to replace that group critique with discussion sessions. And so I'll talk a little bit um, about each of these things and what kind of advantages and disadvantages they had. So in terms of the demonstrations, um, when we're in the studio, they were only like 15 to 20 minutes. I didn't want to take up our, you know, three hour drawing class with half of the time me doing the drawing for them. I wanted them to be practicing their work. Um, and really, so that meant I could only show kind of the initial steps. I could kind of get them started and then I could say like, OK, and then keep going like that. Um, also, there was limited visibility. As I said, everyone kind of just had to crowd around my easel and um, look what I was doing. And it only happened one time. So I did it at the beginning of class. Um, and especially if someone was absent or just needed to kind of review the principles, they didn't really have access to that. So online, the nice thing is that a finished demo from start to beginning, I really tried to keep um, around five to eight minutes. I know I get impatient watching long videos um, and I was pretty positive my students would as well. So the nice thing was that I was able to speed up portions and make those um, a beginning to end from the time you pick up your drawing tool to the time the drawing is finished in five to eight minutes. I will say that Creating a demo video takes about five to eight hours between actually doing the drawing and then doing all the editing. Um, but again, now that those are done, they're done. Um, I really love that it shows the process from start to finish, that they really got a whole full synopsis of what these drawings were going to look like. They're visible and accessible to all students. And also, again, they're available for multiple views. So I've also started using some of these demos in my in-person classes as a way to like help people keep up um, and be able to re-access um, information. So here is one of these videos. I'll go ahead and kind of play at least a portion of it. Um, this particular one does not have sound. So if you're trying to listen to the audio that corresponds with the video, it doesn't. Um, I made most of these videos while we were in lockdown. Um, with my kids home and so I was usually able to carve away some time to draw and edit but I was not really able to find a time when my kids weren't um, making a lot of background noise so um, a lot of these don't have sound um, but I think in terms of missing anything that's the one thing to fall out and my my do hope to kind of add audio um, as I go back and revamp some things one of the things I also really liked about doing the demonstration videos that I think can be hard in the classroom is that I could really, you know, pinpoint and organize my thoughts that instead of trying to draw and talk at the same time and try to give them directions, um, I could just like put this with these kind of sidebars of the instructions. And I could also really focus on the really important key points that I wanted them to focus on. So I didn't um, have to worry about, you know, were they, you know, getting the points that I wanted them to get? You know, were they, um, you know, listening to some kind of side remarks I said and missing the main thing that I wanted them to focus on. So I was able to really think about what I wanted to show in the videos and use these kind of sidebars to pinpoint that information. Um, and you may have noticed at the beginning, I start the videos with a set of goals. So again, going back to you connecting to those module obje objectives and thinking about like, what are you trying to do when you do this drawing? Um, I think when I was a student, there was much more of a sense of, you know, just do this and trust me. Um, and now there's a lot more emphasis on why are we doing this? How does it serve our goals? You know, what am I supposed to be getting out of this? And so adding those at the beginning really helped. Um, and again, the nice thing about these videos is you can, you know, really see up close my hand, how it moves around um, and how, you know, kind of giving a sense of the practice of what I want them to do as they're approaching this. 
Mm-hmm. Jesse, can I add something? Yes, right? please. Uh, I did want to say that uh, for the videos that um, you don't have audio, uh, I did want to point out that you have audio description transcripts for the students who might not be able to. And that was super important because we don't want anybody to lose out because of limited visibility. Um, Yes. So certainly, um, you know, there's a little bit of an assumption that um, someone that's working on drawing is fairly well cited, um, but still, absolutely, everything um, has kind of a description and a transcript to go with it so that someone could kind of read through those steps as well. Um, and so this is also a nice one, too. Um, in the demonstration video and let me see i think it's just coming up is that i was also able to add in kind of a like don't do this portion um and so you know this has a little bit of like the same setup but in the way that i didn't want to see it um come in so this particular project in general is one um, that can easily turn out the way this example was. And so it also was a way of kind of showing them, like, I can visually see the difference when you turn in a drawing that looks like the one that took three minutes and the drawing that took 25 or 35. Um, I will say this is something I want to adjust. I When I was first making the videos, I thought it would be helpful to have kind of a, a quantity of what they should draw. And those I plan to edit out just so it's a little more flexible for me to determine what's realistic goals for the students across the semester. Um, let's see. Let me go back to my slide here. OK. So the other thing was um, creating some structure. So again, like all Tennessee e campuses, um, there are module objectives. Um, and again, as I said, it really was helpful, I think, both to the students to have a sense of like, what are we trying to do through each of these activities? Again, it also helped me connect back to that uh, kind of initial question of like, what do I want the students to get out of this course? And really think about like, what are those important key skills that they should be learning? So really having that clear sense of module objectives um, that maybe I had never really like written out, you know, as clearly in an in-person class um, really helped me kind of keep focused as well as I think provided something for the students. Um, And the other thing in terms of creating some structure was really thinking about scaffolding the assignments um, and developing something that was going to create that sustained and incremental pro progress. So every module is basically set up in the same way um, with, you know, variation of content. And I think that that is the thing that I've really learned about teaching online um, through courses before this course. but creating some sense of consistency because, you know, there's so much to kind of digest and look at that if you're, you know, I think we talk a lot about different ways of learning and different learning styles um, and providing kind of different varieties of assignments, which I think is really valuable. But I think if there's too many different things or they all happen in a different order, you know, it's just too many moving targets. And especially in a practice-based course, where you're really act, asking the students to physically do a lot of different things, having that kind of underlying structure of like, okay, I know I do this smaller assignment first, then I do this medium-based assignment, and then I do this, you know, discussion board, um, gave them kind of a framework that they kind of knew how they were going to progress and also helped them plan their time. So, Jesse, we have a question at this point from Leona. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She would like to know how developing this online course has changed the way you deliver face-to-face -face instruction. Um, yeah, I I think that's a great question. So um, certainly in this past year, I relied a lot on the things that I had structured in the online course um, that I was trying to work with. Sorry, I thought I had all my notifications turned off. So I'm sorry if you're hearing my email bing. Um, I relied on it a lot because, you know, in person, 
there were a lot of things, you know, I used to, especially drawing, I had taught for so many years, I had done it for so many years, was really a course that I could kind of do on the fly. Like I could just be like, oh, 10 minutes until class starts, what are we doing today? And I could kind of just go in there, they're long classes, they're, you know, three hour classes. So there was a lot of time to do different things and change gears. Um, and it was something that I could do pretty flexible, you know, adapt, you know, adapt to be really flexible with. Um, and obviously you just can't do that when you're trying to do either a hybrid or a virtual course. So I relied a lot on the structure that I had um, created through um, the online course to provide some of that structure and consistency. Again, especially like when students were just feeling really anxious because every we all were anxious because everything was out of whack and there was not much to depend on. Um, so I think being able to create that structure gave a little bit of sense of predictability that everyone really needed this past year. Um, I think as I go into uh, going back to teaching in person, um, my plan is to definitely still have all of those video demonstrations available. I think I'll actually um, probably structure my class in such that, you know, I'll ask them to watch that demo first before we meet in a class um, and then maybe do another supplemental kind of quick demo, but really just allow that in-person time to be even more practicing the skills, even more critique, just free up some space that I would have been demoing um, to do other types of discussions or maybe allow me to, you know, throw in a reading or something that then we have time to talk about because they're not having to sit and watch me do a demo. So, um, I think the way that the online course is going to help my in-person courses is really having kind of some of those backup systems. Um, also, giving some greater flexibility for if students, you know, have to miss for things. I think um, I think attendance is really important and really vital, but I also think that people have a lot of other things going on in their lives, and you know, they should be able to miss a class and not feel like it's going to ruin their grade. So being able to kind of say like, OK, you missed this day. Here's the demo. You need to do this assignment at home. So things like that, I think, have really helped. Does that answer your question? Oh, great. Thank you. I OK. Did. Um, so as I said before, in both scenarios, um, I always kind of try to provide examples. Um, so like this is an example um, of artists, I call it artists to aspire to and some other resources. So there's a link to kind of just kind of some history about different types of uses of value. Um, I like using this Poplar um, page for these types of things. Um, it allows you to put in links and kind of other text and descriptions. I really like putting these types of links on a page like this as opposed to a list of links within um, the eLearn system. One, because I think when you have too many things to click on, people just don't do it. Um, I like that this is visual so they can, even if they don't click on the individual links here, even if they don't dive any deeper into this, which I hope they do, um, they can at least see something here to kind of get a quick um, quick view. Also, I really like these pages because I've used them in different sections, both in person or different online sections, um, and I can edit it here and wherever it's linked, you know, it's going to all update automatically. So instead of having to kind of update multiple links in multiple places, I just have kind of one landing spot for that. Um, and so one of the things that's really important to me as well is I try to show a real breadth of um, artists, both from history um, to, you know, more contemporary artists. Um, so this allows me to, especially as I learn about new artists, you know, plug those in wherever they go. So I use this, um, this popular site a lot for a lot of my different teaching. Can, uh, this, I'm sorry, this is Paul. Can I just talk? Uh, yeah. Uh, so you're jumping out of D2L. It, is the reason for that because of copyright reasons or for the images or what? 
No, more for the images. So like I said, um, if I were to, um, where my cursor went. Oh. Um, oh, I'm losing my cursor here. Uh, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll try to click on that again in a minute. Um, like I said, I I could put each one of those links within um, D2L and just have like, you know, a module, kind of a module within a module that was like, here are a bunch of links to look at. But I just don't really know that people would click on every single one of them. Um, and so, so you, and you so can, by you can't put the images on, in, in D2L? Well, you know how like when you put in D2L just like a link, it just shows up as like the text based link. So I would have to, you know, I think Dr. Ramp is asking why we did not create one web page within D2L with all the images embedded and all the same information, um, and why you chose to use the, uh, the popular .me site versus let's creating a static page in D2L. And I think your answer. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I see what you mean. So yeah, I could have created just like a page that had all of those links within that page. Um, but yeah, then I would have had to also probably like download an image to go with it. It's mostly it's speed. Um, and then also, like I said, with this, um, if I edit this page and if I have a link in my in-person drawing one course, um, my online drawing one course, um, and it's linked to a drawing one course that an adjunct is teaching, if I find another resource that I think is going to be valuable, I just add it here one time. And then it automatically, when they click on that link with NG2L, they're going to, all of those different people are going to see that. So it's it's better nested in that way. I don't have to go in three different places and upload that. Um, I also just visually, um, I just think it's a little more legible. Like I think the formatting in D2L, I always kind of struggle with a little bit. So. Is, is, there, is that a free site for the students? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and this is just this is just basically like a web link. Like they don't need any sort of um, credentials, but it is it's free to me as well. I don't pay any sort of subscription to use it. Okay. So it's a nice resource for that. All right, I got my cursor back. Um, um, and then I also show examples of student work. So I want to show them something like highly aspirational, and I also want to show them like something that's realistic. Um, same kind of issues. I post these here because I have them across multiple platforms, and it's just easier for me to edit in one place than like trying to remember did I edit it in all different versions of my course, you know? Um, and so in this, I have examples from both online students and in-person students. So um, I think that also kind of helps hold that those online students to that same standard of what I'm expecting my students in person to work on. Um, but I don't necessarily delineate this was an online student, this was an in-person student. Look, you know, they kind of all um, just are part of the same group. It's the same assignment, you know, the same expectations. So again, going back to that initial goal of having the expectations and the objectives be the same. I want someone that, you know, there's plenty of people I think that take this course just as an elective, but I want someone that is an art major to be able to go on to their next, you know, drawing course or the next painting course and have that instructor go like, okay, like you did all the things you needed to do in drawing one. So. Um, so these are some student examples for them. Um, so the other thing um, that is really important for um, structure is again creating like a consistent calendar. Um, in my intro to art classes, the first time we ran this class, I had followed what I do in my kind of more lecture based intro to art classes, which is to have kind of like one due date that everything's due and then just like a date for responding to discussion posts. 
And I really found that it seemed like people were waiting way till the last minute and then kind of posting everything all at once, um, which is just not possible in a class that in a practice based class. If it's something that requires physical time for it to get done, it has to be done incrementally. Um, and that also just kind of helps with that scaffolding and building those skills. So this is a um, more updated, sorry keep losing my cursor there we go this is a the calendar that I'm planning to use for this fall um, and I know it's tiny type right now for you guys to see but mostly what's important you can see the same type of assignment is always going to be on Tuesdays they have to, they're going to respond to the previous discussion session and post their sketchbook um, and so that also kind of helps some continuity like there's not a big break for them to procrastinate they're kind of going to respond to one thing and already be starting on the next thing um, Thursdays, they're going to do all of their exercises and then by Sunday they're going to post to the discussion boards. So trying to, you know, again, creating that consistency that they're not like, oh, this week it's due Wednesday and that next week it's due Thursday. Um, and that takes a little finagling and a little figuring out, you know, how to make things that potentially take more or less time kind of all fit to the same schedule. Um, but I just, um, really tried to keep track of kind of how long things were taking and adjust those expectations so that they could have that consistency. Um, and then again, we had, I had repetition of the same kind of assignment types. They're kind of low stakes sketchbook assignments that introduce the material. There's a kind of medium exercise and then the culminating project for each module is a discussion. Jesse, can I add something? Yes, please. Uh, with the calendar, I also wanted to add that you sure. made sure that all the dates are within the 2L calendar as well, so students get automatic reminders. But additionally, you went and created these uh, sort of visual calendar pages so they can print and just kind of post them in their rooms or, or whatever. So we do have both uh, versions for students just to help them keep on track. Yeah, I personally find kind of the calendar in the 2L a little bit overwhelming. I like being able to have like, um, and I have that calendar version that I just showed, and I also just have kind of a list version that's just one long list with every due date and every assignment due. Um, and I think that, you know, again, just having kind of a one-stop place that be can become a checklist um, is useful. So they're in both places. Again, anytime I can put things, um, you know, kind of balance that, like I don't want them to be in so many places that they're over clicking on things or they're getting lost, um, but that they can get it in multiple formats. We try to do that. Um, so these are some examples um, and the, these are all from my online course. So what I'm showing you right now, like this is from my online course um, or one that um, one of the adjuncts taught. But so again, that scaffolding, the first um, assignment for a module is a sketchbook assignment. Um, they're pretty low stakes. They're only like 15 points a piece. Um, they're usually a little shorter in time and they're usually focusing on quantity and iteration. So they might have a lot to, of drawings to do, um, but each takes a little bit less time. So they're really about just kind of developing those skills. And so I think for another, you know, subject matter or something, again, thinking about how you could break down what you do in your course into kind of low, medium, and high um, really helps that kind of progression of skills and that scaffolding. And so the kind of mi middle assignment are the exercises. So that's usually kind of br jumping off of something that happened in the, you know, in the sketchbook assignment and doing something maybe a little bit more in depth, maybe using a different material, things like that. And then the final um, culmination of each module is a discussion assignment. Um, and that's also going to include feedback from pe peers. So it's going to take kind of all the things that they worked on in those sketchbook and exercise assignments and apply them to a little bit longer, more in depth um, assignment or drawing. Um, and so again, those also include um, the discussion sessions. And so that includes feedback from the peers. Um, one of the things I really like about a discussion session, um, 
maybe not better than an in-person critique, but maybe it's just a little bit different. Um, one, I can really measure that each student is kind of able to talk about the different and use the different vocabulary, um, which is always one of the functions of a group critique. But as we know, some students are more likely to talk in a group than others. Um, it's hard to record in a group session you know, who talked and it, did they say the right things, right? So being able to read over their writing um, makes it a lot easier to assess, you know, that they are able to do that critique portion, which is one of the course objectives of the course is not only being able to do the drawings, but also have that vocabulary to talk about a work of art. Um, I also think that there are students that because they have that time to respond to specific questions and compose their thoughts. Maybe they say things that they wouldn't say if they were just on the spot in a group critique. Um, and so again, just like kind of being able to look at those and say like, okay, is the composition dynamic? And for them to say, you know, make some really specific um, comments back to the other person. It's also a great thing for me because um, I, since I was a student, am a talker. I am the student that wants to talk a lot in class. Um, and I have to remind myself often in group critique to sit back and let the students just talk to each other. Um, and so with it being in the discussion session, I don't respond in the discussion sessions. I respond to them as I'm grading and give them feedback there. Um, but this really makes it a space where it's just them responding to one another. Um, and so you can see in some of these questions, um, they talk both about just some formal qualities. They ta also start talking a little bit about how those formal formal qualities are connected to expression. Um, they talk about, you know, you know, just modeling some of that, complementing what's successful, what is going on well, and then also what can you improve? How can we build each other up, and how can we, um, you know, encourage each other? to even do better. Um, and I have in the kind of begin here module, um, I also have guidelines for what constructive criticism is um, and the kind of tone that they are required to take. And I really have never had issues um, with people going off of those guidelines. Um, so the other thing that I've developed, um, going back to some of those goals, is I have really specific rubrics. I have a rubric for every single assignment that is specific to that rubric. So rather than one rubric that says like, you know, A, you completed all of the tasks for this assignment, um, it really breaks down exactly what the guidelines were for that specific assignment. Um, and so I will say this is something I really would encourage anyone to do, and I use these a lot in lots of different classes. It's a lot of work on the front end, <laughs> but it makes it so much easier to grade. So going back to that goal, my me goal of like, I want this to be easy to grade. I don't have to in the middle of the semester, you know, when I'm running around doing eight different things, I don't have to go back and like, reread through my own assignment to go like, what did I ask them to do in this assignment? I just have to go into the rubric and say like, oh yeah, you know, we're doing reductive technique. They, you know, the forms are really full or they're not this. So it adds to that objectivity. It makes me feel like I'm not um, just like making a connection to a student, you know, and being like, oh yeah, I like them. They always do a great job, good drawing. You know, I'm really like looking specifically at each of those guidelines and each of those objectives. Um, it's also something that the student can look at the rubrics ahead of time. I have those linked in each module so that they know like how they're gonna be graded so they can um, have some kind of goal setting and kind of be able to hopefully self-evaluate before they turn something in. Um, and then again, it's just, it makes it so easy to go in and just, you know, kind of click and know that um, I'm grading kind of easily and objectively. A lot of front end work, but then once it's set up, I'm not kind of questioning myself and I'm not spending a lot of time having to kind of rewrite the same comment. Um, you know, like, 
okay, you need to fill the page more. You need to fill the page more. You need to fill the page more to, you know, 25 students. So um, this is also one of those things that in terms of my goal of being able to hand this off to other instructors really helps them out a lot because they have a real clear sense of what are the objectives. Um, and so, you know, they can, they can take that on and I can feel confident that, you know, they're grading with the kind of same level of um, kind of intent that I would be. Um, so some, I just want to kind of wrap up with some kind of basic challenges and solutions that I found. Um, one is obviously materials. So in the classroom, I'm able to provide a lot of materials for them. Um, and I'm also able to potentially have them use a lot more materials because some of them, if we're going to only use them once, it's something maybe I can provide. So I really had to think about kind of paring down and focusing on what I thought were the most important materials um, since they were going to have to provide their own. Um, also, I had to think about scale in the classroom. We draw pretty big, like minimum 18 by 24 um, at home. That's a lot to like kind of, you know, cram onto your kitchen counter. So um, I had to think about, again, like what was my larger objective? I wanted them drawing a little bit bigger, but it did it have to be as big as if we were in person? Um, and so just thinking about some of those things and kind of really, again, going back to like what what's really the most important thing here and what do I do just because I've always done it that way and what, you know, is really going to benefit the student and make them able to do this at home. Um, obviously, safety is also important. Um, pretty much most of the materials we use in the studio are um, pretty non-toxic anyway, but you know, I, I don't know that I would ever teach like an oil painting class online because there's issues with ventilation and, you know, solvents and things like that. Um, so that could be a challenge for different types of subject matters. Um, but again, I think there's some creative solutions to that. Um, so another challenge was, again, those time expectations. So that was one thing that I really realized the first time we offered it. I had made a kind of master calendar with the time expectations, but I don't think students were going back and checking that. So I tried to give them those guidelines to say, this assignment's going to take you an hour, this assignment's going to take you three. Um, and they clearly were not necessarily preparing for that. Um, and so one, that calendar, adjusting that calendar so it was more scaffolded so they couldn't kind of procrastinate up until the end of the week. Um, also, we went through and we took that master calendar of time expectations and put it on the front end of each assignment. So at the very beginning of each assignment, it says, you know, this is going to take you an hour and a half to three hours or whatever it is. And they're loose. Some people are going to do things more quickly. Some people are going to take a little bit longer time, but at least some kind of sense of that. Um, I also added kind of like an intro survey in that begin here mo module that one of the questions within it, along with things about, um, you know, their ability to, you know, take a photo and you know, navigate e-learn and things like that was just a question of like how much time do you have dedicated to this class? So they kind of within the first few days have a much clearer sense of like, this is a time intensive class. It's not something you're just going to kind of slip in in the margins. Um, oh, and one thing I want to go back to about the materials. One of the reasons that I produce all of my videos, that I make those Poplar sites and Padlet sites with examples, is and that I give a lot of the information, is that there's no textbook. So I also just make it really clear that Yes, you have to provide all these materials, but that is your textbook. So they're not paying a textbook fee and, you know, buying all these materials. So that's one of the trade offs I make is just I produce a lot of the content so that they are not relying on someone else's textbook um, that they have to buy in addition to the materials they need. So I think you know, and that's kind of in line with a lot of um, movements towards OER resources anyway. Um, but that's always been my strategy is like, I'll provide the 
I am the text or I'll provide that for you. Um, and so then one of the other challenges was really, again, trying to improve on that goal of connecting with my students um, and encouraging that sense of growth, um, that it is a practice based skill that they can learn. So one of the things I've added in is I've added some bonus points that they can um, schedule optional individual meetings with me. I always had a link to a place where they could make a Teams meeting, and I saw that the students that did that, um, you know, really kind of connected to the material more. They felt more confident about going in, you know, and like when they were struggling, I kind of was able to reassure them more that, you know, just to keep going, um, and that was fine. And so um, I added that in as actually a extra credit item um, spread throughout the semester. There's like five different options and um, they can't do all five, like all at the end of the semester. There's kind of windows of time of like, you can meet with me between this week and this week in order um, to get extra credit for this individual meeting. Um, my hope, I haven't seen how that works yet, but my hope is that um, that they will take advantage of it because I find you know all students love extra credit more than they love initial credit um, and I'm hoping that one I'll just be able to make that kind of a little bit more face to face connection with them and really be able to kind of encourage them when they're struggling um, be able to address their concerns a little more clearly um, that maybe they didn't want to email or things like that. Um, and I think it will take a little bit more of my time, but I'm hoping that it will then I'm going to see better quality results um, and have more students that stick with the class over the entire semester um, by making a little bit more of that time for that connection. Um, and then the other thing is I have basically an option like almost every assignment they can either make up or reattempt. Um, I have a midterm deadline and a final deadline, so you know they can't go back and redo the sketchbook assignment from week one during finals week. Um, they have to kind of do that by midterm. But because I really fully believe that practice-based skills are about practice, um, that I really want them to be encouraged to feel like it's not a you did it once that was your grade and now you'll never do it again. I really want to encourage that sense of iteration, redoing things, continuing to build upon their skills. So um, and that also gives them a little bit of sense of, OK, I can try it. I can get some feedback and I can do it again if I need to. Or if I miss something, if my week got really full, I can still go back and do that. Um, so just practicing a little bit more generosity with my students is another way that try to connect to that both that connection and um, that sense of growth that they are able to continually work on something. It's not just a one and done. Um, and then lastly, just some of my personal advice and some of my thoughts about um, my plans for the future. Um, I like to just make notes throughout the semester um, on places where either I realize I need to make an adjustment to something, um, and then I'm able to go back and kind of check those through off in one batch. Again, you don't have that like, did I update that? Did I not update that kind of question? Again, go back to those initial questions I asked and kind of critically give myself some cr constructive critique of, you know, am I meeting those goals? Like where are assignments that maybe could imp be improved? Um, again, respond to student feedback. Um, and also, you know, I had an adjunct teaching one of my class, one of the drawing one classes this past spring. Um, and so it was really valuable to kind of interview her and talk to her about her experience and um, get her feedback as well um, and kind of integrate some of her suggestions into the course as well. And then in terms of my future plans, um, like I said, a lot of the videos I made during quarantine. Um, so I'd at very least like to add some audio. Um, some of them I'd like to reshoot. Um, I'm going to do those little by little. Um, again, because I use that popular site, I can really easily add in new artist examples as they seem relevant. Um, and then I'd like to eventually have maybe some more kind of rotating assignments um, just to kind of, you know, keep things fresh. So 
Um, some assignments I'd like to just kind of incrementally update or some I'd like to maybe, you know, create kind of an alternate, you know, so that I can switch them out every couple semesters. Um, and then one thing I'm planning to do for the fall is um, include some intelligent agents so that again, I can be kind of checking in with those students and um, saying like, oh, I noticed, you know, you didn't, um, you know, score that high on this, or I noticed you didn't respond to any of your peers in the discussion session and um, be able to do that a little more hands off, but that will create a more hands on approach that then that'll prompt them to reach back out to me and we can hopefully solve some of those problems. So um, that is um, kind of my experience. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, if you want to reach me, um, jesse.vanderlaan at ws.edu. Um, so and I'm I'm going to unshare my screen and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. It's Paul again. Um, I'd like to go back to the kind of critique peer interaction kind of piece of the of the course. Yeah. If my understanding, and I might be wrong, but my understanding is is you're doing that on the discussion tool. Yeah. And so the students post their work in discussion and then respond to others. Yeah. So okay. um, so yeah. So they have um, they post whatever. So the like I said, the discussion board is the kind of culminating assignment of each module. So they'll post their drawing for, you know, like the examples I showed were the reductive self portraits. Um, so they'll post those. Um, and then there's a due, so there's a due date for that. Um, those I'm pretty loose with on the due date just because there's not a function in D2L to kind of set two due dates for discussions, which maybe someday they'll make that update. Um, but I have kind of a suggested deadline for when they need to post just so there's time for everyone to respond. Um, and then there's a lock date by when the discussion board closes and everyone has to respond. They have to respond to four other peers. And again, I have some kind of specific questions that I want them to answer so they can't just say like, hey, good drawing, man, I like it. You know, like they have to actually go through and again, employ that vocabulary. Um, and I actually have it broken down in their rubric for those discussion boards, like response one, response two, response three, response four, um, so that I can really specifically uh, grade them based on, you know, how much, you know, they're using the vocabulary um, correctly and how much they're, you know, responding fully to those prompts and like giving actual valuable feedback. So did you ever uh, kind of explore utilizing some of these tools? I don't think there's anything in D12 that does it, but these external tools for their kind of collaborative whiteboard spaces like Miro or something like that to uh, have a site there for your course. I haven't um, mostly because like there's not much that they're collaborating on. Um, it's more, you know, they're just kind of responding to those questions. Um, in my virtual, like my DVC course for my um, Walter State drawing course, we used the class notebook and teams. So in that I did have things where I would like break them out into um, the breakout groups and I would have them like work on a form together or talking, you know, having some discussion and kind of recording that discussion. So I've used it for um, a synchronous virtual class, but I've tried to figure out, um, you know, again, trying to like really foster all that communication, but really making sure that it is asynchronous. So I haven't, um, I find those whiteboard things a little bit better when people are kind of able to work on them simultaneously. So I've just done it. Um, yeah, I'm just sorry, I'm just thinking here and it, it probably is inappropriate for the course. I'm just, you know, if, if, if uh, you know, students were able to kind of post their work in progress and then kind of get feedback in progress, because I, 
I don't, I'm not sure how much that happens in a face to face course in your drawing classes, but there's a potential there for that. Oh, yeah, certainly. Right, no, one, uh, I think, uh, um, yeah, that, that is one thing that's missing. There's a little bit less of that kind of in between time that like when we're in like an in person class, I can kind of stop people in the middle and kind of say like, hey, look at this or, you know, um, everyone take a break, break and walk around the room real quick, you know, so that is missing. Um, I think it's a little bit with an online course of a balance of enough kind of incremental assignments that they're building through things, but not where they're spending more time posting than they are doing the drawings. Um, so I try to kind of balance that. And um, also, like I said, the external things that I use are mostly like passive on their end. So they're not having to learn a different kind of format or technology. Um, I have used the Padlet site in my art appreciation or my intro to art classes before where they have to post to that. Um, Cause that's pretty, it's real simple to use. Like it's, you know, um, and so that would be a place that potentially they could like post an in-progress drawing and that they do have um, a comment section on there. Um, but I try to, you know, again, just trying to bridge that gap between like added resources and also simplicity. So they're not feeling overwhelmed by like a new thing that they have to figure out how to use. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.